we turn this morning, please, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. We're going to read the whole chapter this morning from verses 1 down to verse 23. And this morning's sermon is titled, An Exhortation to Holiness. An Exhortation to Holiness. Romans chapter 6. And we'll begin in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead, up from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised up from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness." For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let me open in prayer this morning and commit this time to the Lord. Well, Father, we thank you again this morning, recognizing we need your grace. My Lord, what we have before us this morning, these words are most powerful. And I pray this morning that, Lord, you would take these words and wing them to our hearts and that you would open the understanding of our minds and hearts that we may grasp and lay hold on this marvelous truth that is contained in the sixth chapter of this book of Romans. 
dynamite, Lord, powerful stuff, that if we understand and lay hold on, Lord, and apply to our lives, we truly shall experience thee afresh, Lord. And I pray that you will break into our company this morning and bring the light of the truth of thy word and of thy gospel to bear in our hearts that you may be glorified. Help me in all of my weakness and in all of my inabilities this morning. God, make up for that and give grace upon grace, I pray and ask this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. An exhortation to holiness. It's been an absolute blessing thus far in our study through the book of Romans to have had the privilege of expounding the great positional truths of the gospel, the riches, the depth of God's love, of his mercy, of his grace, the utter helplessness and depravity of our former standing, the utter barrenness and bankruptcy of our account pre-Christ. And yet against such a backdrop, the gospel of Jesus Christ shines its piercing light. It cries forth to all sinners, look to Jesus and be saved. See one hanging on that cross, See the precious blood flowing from his hands, from his head, from his feet, from his side. God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 19 and 21. Righteousness, as we have been looking at, was imputed or placed into our account on the grounds of faith alone, justification by faith. And this great doctrine is indeed the very foundation. It is the pillar of our hope as Christians. Positionally, we stand in a place of righteousness in the sight of a holy God. Not on the basis of works, but of his work and our faith in that work, in that finished work and in his son who God rose again from the dead. And having looked at that and spent considerable time covering these points, I want to ask this morning, what else? What else? What else? Redemption, as I pointed out last week, is far more than just sins forgiven. Far more than just sins forgiven. But rather, as we pointed out last week, redemption is the very undoing of the effects of the fall in the grand scheme of things. Redemption, yes, whilst it involves the forgiveness of our sins and all that was involved in that, at its heart and root, it's is the means by which God seeks to purchase for himself a people. And as I said, it is the very undoing of the effects of the fall, a restoring from sin unto righteousness, a restoring of sin unto righteousness, reaching its full conclusion, though beginning in this life, reaching its full conclusion in the life to come at the resurrection. Yet I ask, this morning, where does that leave us now, here and now, in the present? And for many, their only response is, it leaves us forgiven. It leaves us forgiven. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 5 and verse 21. As death or sin reigned unto death, we're told that 
Grace did much more abound. Even so we're told that grace might reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. As we pointed out last week, the righteousness of Christ and on account of what he has done, we read in verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience in Romans chapter 5, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Through the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And thus many can Christians leave it there. And when asked what Christ has done for them and what the cross means to them, they can answer with one word and rightly so, forgiveness. But dear brothers and sisters, Paul didn't stop there. Paul didn't just stop there. And many can Christians are content to conclude that the only difference between a sinner and a saint is that we're forgiven. The only difference. You mean to tell me the only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is that the Christian is forgiven? And they will say yes. Indeed, there's a very song that echoes this very sentiment. And in that song it says, a saint is just a sinner who fell down, but we get up. In other words, the only difference between a saved person and an unsaved person is forgiveness. We're just sinners, we're told, saved by grace. Sinners saved by grace. And whilst that is true, whilst that is true, we see that many are content to dwell there. And their mantra throughout their whole life is, well, all I'm going to be is a rotten sinner. But thank God that he doesn't look at my sin. He sees me in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. And whilst that is absolutely true, thank God that he does see us, not in our own righteousness, but in the righteousness of his, righteousness of his, of his son, Jesus Christ. If that is all that you have, and that you mean to say that we continue in our sins exactly the same as we were post-Christ, or sorry, pre-Christ, then dear friends, this is a perversion of grace. It is an absolute perversion of grace. And this morning I want to ask, not of imputed righteousness, righteousness laid to our account, but what of righteousness imparted? Righteousness imparted. Paul says in verse 1, and this message this morning is very pertinent, it's very precious to my own heart, because if we would lay hold on the truths contained in this one chapter, it has the capacity to cut right through the lie of 21st century Christianity and to literally change lives through a change of mind and perspective. It's what happened to me many years ago as I wrestled with the truths contained in this wonderful chapter, seeking to reconcile not only the theology of this chapter, but seeing in a state of great need and desperation how these theological truths can become reality in my own life. Because as we're going to see, many gladly read through this chapter. And for them, it's just theology. To them, it's about positional standing with God. Seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And it's all this pie in the sky stuff. But when asked, how does this come down from heaven and come into a life in practice? They're unable to tell me. But dear brethren, I don't believe that Paul simply meant that these words be some lofty expression. But that he meant in these words to say, look Christian, this ought be your experience. And that's all the difference in the world. Paul says in verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Remember he has just finished his discourse in Romans chapter 5. 
And in verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And he speaks of how where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And as white is seen to be ever more exceeding white is set when set against the backdrop of black, most assuredly, Grace is seen to be the more exceeding glorious when set against the backdrop of man's wickedness, man's total depravity written off. And we see that the glorious grace of Jesus Christ and of our God stepped into the midst of darkness and scooped men out of their iniquities and their sins. And Paul, in true rabbinic style, Seeking to present a question and then to answer the question. Says, look, what shall we say then in the light of this? In the light of man in his darkest hour, the light and the glory of Christ and the grace of God breaking forth. Righteousness being laid to his account. What shall we conclude then? That we should continue to live in darkness. That the grace of Christ might be exceedingly more shown. Remember we dealt with this earlier on in Romans chapter 3. And Paul's picking up this theme now and he's seeking to combat this notion. And he says in just two words, God forbid. God forbid. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And he now spends the rest of this chapter unpacking this wonderful truth. Paul is saying with such force, his argument is like saying to a man who has no legs, walk. And to a man who has no sight, see and behold. Paul is saying what? If you were dead to sin, how can you live any longer therein? And we say, Paul, what do you mean? And Paul now seeks, as I said, to unpack this and tell us exactly what he means by this. And I wish to God there were more in this church this morning that could hear this message. Because the truth contained in it is so awesome and so powerful. Because I fear, brethren, that many have been sold the lie. That when Paul said, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I fear today that the answer would come back with an affirmative, yes, Paul. We should. And there are many Christians that view the grace of God in this way. And they take boast and joy in the grace of God, which just forgives them of all their sin. And they take great joy and pride that they can continue to live in sin and God understands and then his grace just continues to forgive. This is not the gospel message at all. Paul says absolutely this should be reprobate and reprehensible because something took place on the cross which was more than just sins forgiven. And as I said, there exists a generation of Christians who know nothing of this glorious truth. And I think even in Paul's day, the same was true. Because look what Paul says in verse 3, Know ye not. Do you not know? Are you ignorant? Are you without knowledge of this mystery? That so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, I myself was counted among the ignoramuses here. I myself was ignorant for the, I think, for the first five years of my Christianity. Whilst I didn't go all out into sin, absolutely not. There was a definite change in my heart. But at the same time, there was a theology that I was exposed to, which allowed for people to continue in sin, and that somehow the grace of God understands His mercy understands that we're just human beings and it's what humans do. We sin after all. And so don't worry too much about it. This is what grace is. The pardon in favor of God to those who are undeserving. And whilst the inward witness and the Spirit of God was saying, look, stop doing this. 
the word that was coming forth to me was, why? well, don't worry too much about it. And you see, that's why theology is absolutely important. Because what we believe affects how we live. And there are many that are being sold this today and told, look, don't worry about it. God understands. God understands. And Paul says, look, are you ignorant on this matter? Do you not understand that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, baptism for us is what? It's an outward sign of an inward change in one's heart. And Paul uses this ordinance of baptism, this outward sign, to show an inward reality of what took place at conversion, at conversion. Paul is not here supporting the false notion of baptism or regeneration. It is a doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, it's a doctrine of, of um, oneness Pentecostals as well, and many other cults buy into this false notion that salvation takes place at the point of baptism that somehow literal water has the power to enact any change and supernatural power. We deny this. We deny this. The word of God denies this. Paul's language is spiritual. It cannot be said that we physically died with Jesus, can it? Well, I'm still standing here. It can't be that I've been buried with him physically, can it? Well, no, because I'm still here and that I rose again. No. It's spiritual language that Paul is conveying here and speaking to us in a mystery. Listen in verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness, likeness, which means he's using these things to bring out a richer meaning, is likening what ha happened on the cross to what has taken place in conversion. And baptism is the evidence or the symbol of that. It, it shows forth this wonderful mystery that Paul here is making mention of. Furthermore, Paul has already laid the grounds of how a man is justified. He quite clearly in chapters 3 and 4, he says, justification is by faith in Jesus Christ. He can't now come and undo that and say, well, actually, it's baptism. No, our justification is secured by faith in Jesus Christ. But what we must also understand is this, that it's quite important. In the account of the early church, as we have recorded for us in the book of Acts, conversion and baptism were immediate events. In other words, the church didn't wait as our modern society does, that after someone made a profession of faith and passed from death to life, they put them on a six-month probation before they went down into the waters of baptism. I can understand why people today do that, because many make professions, and, and furthermore, six months later, they're back into the world, and they don't want to bring disgrace and shame to the body upon the name of Christ, that here was a man going down in the water, and six months later, is returned to the dung of the world. I can understand that. But you see, where conversion was true and proper in the first century because the proper gospel was being preached and men were repenting and turning from their sins, we see that the moment they were saved, we see that they were then baptized. They were then baptized. And so the two really, not salvation was by the profession, absolutely, but, and in the turning away from sin, but the baptism very evidently showed what had taken place. We see this in Acts chapter 2. I'll just show you in a few passages. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Paul makes mention of this also, of us being baptized into Jesus in Galatians 3.27. And this really is what he's talking about. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, on the day of Pentecost, you remember, many were added to the church. And we were told that they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day, the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They were baptized on the same day of Pentecost. 
Devon down. The Ethiopian eunuch, you remember in Acts chapter 8 and verse 35? Acts chapter 8 and verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, What if thou believest? See, faith is the emphasis again. With all your heart you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. At that moment, that man passed from death to life. He believed. And what did Philip do? He commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And again in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius and his whole household, we see that they were saved. They received the gift of the Spirit of God, just as Peter had done on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 10 and verse 44. While yet Peter spoke these things or these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So they were saved, they received the Spirit of God, but then we see in, um, in verse 48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So yes, faith always precedes baptism, and salvation comes by faith alone. At the same time, very quickly, when someone believed, they were then baptized. And Paul draws on this symbolism, draws on this event to show really what has taken place in the heart. In the heart. Baptized into Jesus Christ. As one goes down into the waters of baptism, what are we symbolizing? That we're dying to this world. That this old man that is going down into the waters is going down unto a death. He's being buried, which is why we believe in submersion in water. And then as he rises out of that water, it is symbolizes rising forth as a new person in newness of life. And Paul says, look, in verse 4, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In other words, theologically granted, this is what it represents, but look, it should have some impact and change in one's life. You don't mean to say that this can just be that I go down into water and it symbolizes my dying with Christ, my being buried with Christ, my raising again with Christ, and then the result is, well, there's no change in the life. Paul says, absolutely not. Even so, we should walk in newness, of life. Paul brings this theology down to earth. And that there are two great aspects to this mystery that I want to speak about this morning. The mystery of conversion. Because I believe the words that Paul here is writing, it's, some people believe in a second blessing that you're saved and you almost live this inferior Christian life where you struggle with sin and live in sin and then suddenly you have this second experience whereby you now have the mastery over sin. I don't see the Bible saying that whatsoever. It is at conversion we receive the Spirit of God into our hearts and it, at conversion we are changed. Otherwise our conversion is not conversion. What does it say in 2 Corinthians 5.17? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. At the moment one believes, he becomes, he, he is planted into the body of Christ and he becomes a new creature. Old things are passed away. There is the dying with Christ. Behold, all things are become new. That's the rising up. With Christ, death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. 
For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And so Paul is here expounding these things to us. Let us look first at our dying with Christ. And this is mysterious what is being shared here. But it is a truth that if we lay hold on by the Spirit of God and seek to apply by faith to our lives, dear brethren, it changes one's life. It brings the experience to measure with the head knowledge and the theology and the two are knit together. And no longer will we use that excuse, ah, well, we're just sinners doing what sinners do. No, that was our former standing pre-Christ. Let us look at our death with Christ, our dying with him. In verses 6 and 7. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Our old man is crucified with him. What Paul is saying is, look, something took place on the cross. Something took place on the cross where not only was Christ dying for our sins, but that in this somehow we too was dying with him. We too was dying with him. And Paul is simply saying, look, the cross of Jesus Christ is more than just a place of forgiveness. It's more than just a place of forgiveness. Our old man, which means the man pre-Christ, the old Adamic sinful nature that man possesses, died a death died a death, it was crucified with Christ. The old man was delivered a death blow on the cross that the body of sin might be destroyed, the vehicle of sin, the strength of sin might be destroyed, might be destroyed. And that word destroyed means to render entirely idle, to be put out of use. It means to be disempowered. That henceforth, from now on, we should not serve sin. We should not serve sin. And Paul here, as I'm going to show, is not teaching sinless perfection. There's another heresy, another false doctrine, which says that when we come to Christ, we never sin again. Paul isn't saying that. What he is most certainly saying is, look, the power of sin, which was contained in the fallen man, inherited from Adam, as he'd just been explaining in Romans chapter 5, has been rendered entirely idle, has been rendered powerless now through the death of Jesus Christ. And that those who are now found to have died with him and risen with him, should not serve sin anymore. Sin should not be our master anymore. Sin should not have dominion, authority, and lordship over our lives anymore. This is what Paul is saying. That we should not be a slave, a doulos of sin, or the Greek word here is doulio. In 1 John chapter 2, we understand the Bible doesn't teach sin this perfection. Because it says here, look, Paul said, I, or John said, I write these things that you sin not. In 1 John chapter 2, he's writing to them that they sin not. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin. So he does allow for the possibility. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. What is Paul saying here that we'll never sin again? That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this, look. We've been planted together in the likeness of Christ's death. The old man with his sinful passions and sinful lusts has been put to death 
in Jesus Christ. The body of this death has been rendered idle. It has been rendered powerless. That from now on we should not serve sin. Sin should not be our master. Because he says in verse 7, Look, for he that is dead is freed from sin. We've been delivered and set free through the death of Jesus Christ that we have died with him and we've been made free from the dominion and the power and the rule of sin in our lives. And dear brothers and sisters, today's gospel is absolutely deficient and powerless. Why? Because it presents to men half a deal. It tells the poor sinner that he can have forgiveness of sins, but then leaves him still in his sins. What kind of good news is that? It is like taking the beggar from the dunghill, putting a set of clean clothes on his soiled back, and then casting him back into the dunghill and saying, God bless you. What does the scriptures tell us? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 9 through to 11. Not only does it tell us of sins forgiven, praise God for that, but it tells us about changed lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, and I don't make apology for reading this again. Know ye not that the unrighteousness, sorry, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Paul makes that absolutely clear, but look, and such were some of you. Past tense, that is what you were, but ye are washed. But ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Not only have you been washed, not only have you been justified and declared righteous in the sight of God, but what? You've been sanctified. You've been brought into a state of holiness. You've been separated as a branch being broken off a tree. You've been set aside now that the old things might be done away with and now you might serve God in newness of life, bringing forth fruit, meat for repentance. This is the gospel message. And dear brethren, it gets even better. Not only has the old man been stripped of his power, but we have received regenerating life. Praise the Lord. Not only has the old man been rendered idle, but we have also received regenerating life. For we, if we have been planted in verse 5 together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 8, now if we be dead with Christ, this is Romans 6 and verse 8. If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Paul declared what in Galatians 2.20? I am crucified with Christ. Paul recognized that this was his standing that when Christ died, he too died with him. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. The old man has been rendered powerless and been put out of action. Nevertheless, he said, I still live. How, Paul? Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Regenerating life. And we'll come to that in Romans chapter 8. Because those who are in Christ receive what? The Spirit of God, which is life unto, from the dead. 
Paul says, I live, yet not I, but Christ now, or Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We live now with Christ. We have been quickened and made alive that we should now present our members as living members from the dead. Dear brethren, our former standing was what? That we were slaves to sin. Paul will come on and we'll read this in a moment. You don't have to convince me of that. I knew full well. I was an absolute slave to sin. And guess what? I had no power. No power at all to combat this fearsome enemy. It took me out again and again and again and again. I was a slave to sin. As a moth is drawn towards light, I was drawn towards darkness and iniquity. It was in my very fabric, in my very fiber. And religion is the greatest sham of all because what it tells men, look, even though they're sinful in their hearts, it tells men, look, please, can you try and keep these commandments? Can you please try and turn over a new leaf? And what happens? Men become hypocrites because they're not able to do that which they profess because they're riddled with sin. But Paul says, look for the Christian, this is not so. Sin's forgiven, yes. Righteousness imputed, yes. But then there comes a change in one's life. And as I said, there are many that are content to allow this to be a positional truth. And what I mean by positional truth, I just mean a, the a, a theological statement that's theory, or, or that say it's fact, but it's in heaven somewhere. And so you try to say to them, well, um, we've been planted together in, in the death of Christ. And they'll say, well, praise the Lord for that. Yes, we're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Yes, praise God, we're seated in heavenly places. But meanwhile on earth, they know nothing of this in experience. They live like dogs and all the time cling to theological truths. What does Paul say in verse 11? He says, look, this reality, whether you believe it or not, is true. And I remember grappling with these things and trying to say, look, this old man is dead. How does this become a reality in my life that I can begin to live in victory over sin? Verse 11 set me free because Paul says, likewise, in like manner as the things that I have just told you, reckon or consider, take it as yours, by faith, that you are dead indeed to sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is something that we must apply by faith and take it, Lord, I believe thy word. Something took place on conversion and I've been sold a lie. I've been sold a cheap grace that tells me, look, just don't worry about it. You're going to always be the sinner you are. And this is the grace of God to forgive, to forgive, to forgive. But Paul says, no, he forgives absolutely. But the grace of God is so much more than that. And the plan of salvation is so much more than that. And the gospel message is so much more than that. Because Paul said, when Christ died, you died with him. The old man was rendered powerless. And you ought now not to give yourselves over to sin anymore. The excuses were ripped from under my feet and the lie exposed for what it was. And I was brought to the actuality and the reality that I sin. If I want to sin, I choose to sin. It's my responsibility because what Christ has done is given me back now a choice that before I knew the Lord, I didn't have a choice not to sin. I was a slave to sin. But now in Christ Jesus, I have been given a choice that I don't have to sin. And if I sin, it's because I choose to sin. And not because if somehow it's who I am and all I'll ever be. It's not what God is saying. 
Consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And look, this is our responsibility in verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. It's just like, take that. Don't let sin therefore Count yourselves dead in Christ and alive as a new creature in Jesus Christ. And if that be so, you have a responsibility. I have a responsibility. God help us that we would not allow sin to have the mastery of this body anymore. Does it mean we'll never sin again? I'm not saying that. The word of God doesn't teach that. But what it does teach is this. That sin no longer is the master and the ruler of our bodies. And we're not to allow sin to reign in our lives. That we should obey it in the lusts thereof. Will we still be tempted? Well, it tells us here, we will be. But it tells us, look, don't obey those lusts. Reject them. Say no. You have the power now to say no. Through the grace of God. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness, nor yield your members, that means to give them over, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. We must not allow sin to reign in our mortal body. It acknowledges that we're still in this Our bodies are still subject to death. We're still, if you like, living in dying bodies, not to be fully put off until the resurrection. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 52 and 53, that we have a responsibility now that we yield our members as instruments of righteousness, As those that are alive from the dead, we're to present them to God. Turn please to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and I'll read the first few verses here. It says the same things. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 1, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. So you understand some mind change that's needed. An inward reality has happened. If you are in Christ, you've been saved. This is reality. But the problem is, is our minds need to adjust to understand what has taken place in conversion so that we're not deceived. Paul says, look, set your affections on things now above and not things on the earth, for you are dead, in verse 3, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What does this mean in practice then, Paul? Paul. Verse 5, mortify therefore, put to death, you make the conscious decision to do that, to deny these members, though the lust might be a reality and these eyes might be wanting to lust, deny them, though these hands might be wanting to do things they ought not, deny them, mortify, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness which is idolatry, For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked some time when you lived in them, but what? But now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And have what? Put on the new man, the new man in Christ which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. This is the gospel. This is the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. And I ask this morning, is this a reality in your life? Is this a reality in my life? 
Listen to what Paul is saying in verse 14 as he concludes this in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion. Remember Paul has said, look, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, alive to God. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Don't yield or give over your members, your faculties as tools to commit wickedness with, but yield yourselves to God. Present those same members as instruments to drive righteousness to God. Why? For sin shall not have dominion. It shall not have the lordship over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. But under grace. And so we're today told where we're under grace. So live in sin and God will forgive. Paul says absolutely the opposite. The reason why we're not to walk in sin is because we're under grace. Because we're under grace. What is Paul saying? Well, we understand that the strength of sin was the law because the problem was the heart of man. Romans chapter 7 will come on to next week. The problem was the heart of man being given that which was holy and not being able to keep it. There was a fundamental flaw in his character when he fell and he was drawn towards sin. Paul says, look, we've been made free from that law, but we've now been translated under grace so that now... We're not under the law anymore. There's a change that's took place in our hearts. And sin has been delivered the death blow. For many, grace is what? It's merely the kindness of a loving God, his gracious disposition towards undeserving sinners to forgive them. Yet I ask this question, what kindness is it? What graciousness is it to still leave a thief a thief? What kindness is it to still leave a liar a liar? It's like this. Grace is like this. Is it God's kindness? Is it God's favor? It absolutely is. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what does grace bring with it? Not only forgiveness of sins, but also deliverance from the power of sin. It's like a businessman who steps in to rescue a sinking company. He doesn't just throw money at it, does he? If that company's going down, he can't just throw money at the problem. God can't just throw forgiveness at the problem because he has to address the fundamental root why that business is sinking. And so he comes in with a rescue package. He comes in with a team. It is a package which he implements. And so it is with redemption. That package is to be finally completed at the resurrection. But God has done more than just forgive us of our sins. He's given to us his spirit that we have been now made quickened and been made alive in Jesus Christ. This is the grace of God. This is his kindness. In Titus chapter 2, if we turn there, please, and then we'll finish um, the rest of Romans and we'll be done of chapter 6. Titus chapter 2. Turn, please, to Titus chapter 2. And verses 11 through to verse 13. We've messed up what grace is because we failed to see what grace brings with it. What God's kindness has done on the cross of Jesus Christ. Verse 11 of Titus chapter 2, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Notice, the grace of God that brings what? Salvation. The package. Salvation, deliverance. Which is what the word means. Teaching us what? That we can continue in sin and God will forgive? Teaching us that denying ungodliness, this is what the grace of God which brings salvation and has appeared to all men teaches us, look. Denying all ungodliness and worldly lusts. 
We should what? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. This is what the grace of God that brings down salvation teaches us. That you're a new person in Christ, old things have passed away, and live accordingly, and turn from wickedness, and turn from sin, and serve the Lord. Sin is no longer your master. So Paul says, what then in verse 15 of Romans 6? Shall we, can, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Have we been made lawless that we should just continue now in sin? We're not under the law anymore. Paul says again, God forbid. God forbid. And he brings in another line of reasoning here, another angle in which to come at this in trying to show the reality of what took place at conversion. Know you not, in verse 16, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Paul says, look, this is an optional. Who is your master? Who is your master? To whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servant you are. If you present your members to sin, then you will receive death. If you present your members to obedience, then righteousness shall be our master. Many within the church celebrates and Hails it a success. If, for instance, the alcoholic, inverted commas in Christ, turns from drinking two bottles of whiskey a day to just one, the church rejoices. Wow, praise the Lord. Or a man who beats his wife every day of the week and now says, I'm just going to do it one day. The church measures that as progress. Yet we're told in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24 that they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. And as Paul has already said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, look, don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. Don't allow people to tell you, look, you can live as you want and there are no consequences. Paul says, whether you name the name of Christ or not, if you present your members to sin, then the result will be death. Christian or no Christian, the result will be death. We're not immune. Who is your master? We cannot say with our mouths it is Christ, but with our bodies we declare it to be another. Paul says, look, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? A man who gets drunk every day, I don't care whether he names the name of Christ or not, he's not inheriting the kingdom of God. I say that on the authority of the word of God. This is what the word of God tells us. The unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. If you're a fornicator, you need to repent because in your fornication, you will die and go to hell. That's what the word of God tells us. Idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, abusers of themselves and mankind, it says here. Thieves, covetous, drunkards and revilers extortioners Paul says you aren't you shall not inherit the kingdom of God and he says that was your former standing such was some of you as I've already read and Ephesians 5 he says exactly the same thing because there's this lie today brethren that is comforting people in their sin and giving them a ticket to heaven whilst they continue in gross immorality and I'm saying this morning the word of God says if you want to live like that you will go to hell and the grace of God knows it is an absolute perversion to say that God understands that you can be a named Christian and, and not repent. No. Grace is there for us to repent and to get right with God. This is what the Word of God tells us. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 1. Ephesians 5 and verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God 
as dear children and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. But look in verse 3. It's all over the word of God. What are we reading? Fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be named once among you as becometh saints, as becometh ones professing holiness. Ones who have died and have been risen with Christ. He says, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. And look in verse 5. For this you know, Paul made it clear amongst the people. You know this, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. And again he says this, look in verse 6. Let no man deceive you otherwise with vain, empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Come out, lest ye receive of the same judgment. Be not therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, post pre-Christ, before Christ. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And as I said, we'll pick more upon this of the Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit in, in, in Romans chapter 8. I want to save that till then. And so in finishing today, these are strong words, but they are words that need to be said. And we need to be, encourage one another, and we need to not get comfortable with sin. Every one of us, because at the end of the day, we're waiting for what? We're waiting when finally this mortal flesh shall put off mortality, and we shall be clothed with immortality. I can't wait. But in the meantime, I have to battle with sin every single day and bring it under subjection. Because there's still a tendency within this fallen body to gravitate towards sin. And it is my responsibility as a new creature in Jesus Christ to live like that. And to deny by the strength of the Holy Spirit this carnal man. And to present my members as alive from the dead unto God. It's my responsibility. Look what Paul says in verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were, past tense, were the servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart. You've obeyed from the heart. You said, yes, that form of doctrine which was delivered you, which I'm delivering you today. Being then made free from sin, being released from sin, emancipation, being set free from sin. Does that mean that I can now live as I want? Look, you've become the servants of righteousness. We're all servants of something, either of sin or of righteousness. And Paul says our former standing is that we were servants of sin. That word doulos or doulu means on free we were a slave to sin. We, sin was our master. What these eyes wanted, the heart wanted, I, I gave in. I, it reigned, it ruled. But we've been delivered, we've been emancipated, set free, bought with the blood of Christ. We've now become the servants, or they became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have Past tense, yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity. Even so, now the commandment goes forth this morning. Yield your members servants to, to righteousness, unto holiness. Unto holiness. You see, there's a false holiness today that is concerned all with the externals. But true holiness deals with the heart. True holiness deals with 
What are we looking at? What are we choosing to entertain in our thoughts? Or how are we choosing to exercise self-control in this matter when I just feel like, ah, oh. but self-control says return a kind word. It's difficult. But brethren, it is made incredibly more difficult when we buy into the lie, we'll just let rip. And God understands that is absolute destructive poison. Rather than this doctrine which says you have the power, even though you might be feeling angry, to just have some self-control. It's a fruit of the Spirit. There's no excuse. We've been set free from sin. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from unrighteousness. We didn't know righteousness anything. Sin was our master and we served it spot on. We gave it everything. But what happened, Paul said, what fruit had you in those things whereof you were now ashamed in verse 21? There was no fruit. It led to death. For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. We've been set free. We don't owe sin anything anymore that we should serve it. We're now servants to obey God. And you remember the words in finishing in John chapter 8 and verse 31. These beautiful words, which oftentimes are quoted, but the real essence of what the Lord is saying is, is so often missed. In John chapter 8 and verse 31, we know it so well. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's sin, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Look what the Lord brings, the context. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin, whoever practices sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus was offering to these people freedom and deliverance from the power of sin. They were slaves to sin as we were once. And Christ was extending to these people that look, he was coming to offer them life and life more abundantly. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Dear brethren, I leave you with these words this morning, a mighty challenge, but there is nothing else to preach. As I said, this chapter changed my life forever because it ripped away from me the excuse that I'd been handed that, well, we're all faulty sinners and we're just going to do what sinners do. So destructive, so destructive. And it didn't bear any witness to the Spirit of God which was convicting me of my sin. I mean, when I first got saved, I was living in fornication. And the Spirit of God was convicting me rotten, rotten. And men of God who should have known better were telling me, well, it's chemistry, it happens, don't worry about it. And I tried to reconcile what I was being taught with what the conviction that I felt in my heart. And the two didn't mix. And I had to do what I knew that God's Spirit was telling me to do, repent and stop it. And so I did and got married to my wife. And later came to understand that I'd been told a lie. That I was actually being helped on my way to destruction. If I had heeded that so-called wisdom, it was poison. Dear brethren, I don't say this morning continue in sin. I say grace has been provided for you to come out. 
And this is a challenge that I have to implement every day in my life. And we need each other to encourage each other along the way. But may God give us grace to live victoriously as Christians and to present our members alive as pleasing to the Lord. Amen. And so, Father, this morning I thank you for the word of God. And even as I have shared this, I'm so mindful in my own personal life how at times I can let this truth slip, Lord, and give in, Father, disobey, Lord, when I have been given all power to obey. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord Jesus. And I ask, Lord, that this wonderful truth could be central to our thinking and that we might rise above the standard, the bench that has been set in this fallen generation, which is so low, Lord, that barely shall any escape the fires of hell. Oh God, help us not to live in deception, but that we might raise the bar to the standard which we find in thy word, that we are to forsake sin and iniquity, to flee from it, Lord, and to find mercy at the cross of Jesus Christ, where is forgiveness. So I commit these things into your hands. In Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen.